Did, did any of the Canadians in Ottawa see the snowbirds? Fly yeah. Over? I missed them. Many times. Them. They went back and forth oh. and back and forth. And they had a, a symbolic fighter jet with them mm -hmm. for the yeah. um, Indigenous uh, children. Yeah, yes. it was quite moving. Mike and I went out for a walk, and just as we were going out, they flew over our house. Uh, yeah. I don't know where I was. I didn't even hear them. Oh, really? They Isn't were. It? I might have been. I had to run up to the drugstore. Maybe I was in there. <clears throat> So was the um, plane symbolizing the Indigenous children in formation or not? Yeah, was it was. It was. They had the nine snowbirds and the, the uh, CF-19 or whatever it was, was in just be just sort of nestled in behind the V following with them. Hmm. But I heard it was also for the essential workers, too. I've been hearing different. Oh, but they did I, a lot I, of fly pass. I read their... The Twitter, their Twitter, and it said they were doing it for the indigenous children and communities, but maybe no. they added well, something maybe, too. Maybe CBC didn't read the Twitter and they just made <laughs> Well, CBC didn't talk about the churches being burned. Oh, I heard them talk about it on mm. the news. You didn't. No, you didn't hear it? Oh, no, they were talking, yeah, the Catholic, another Catholic cathedral in Manitoba got burned and yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, not good. Nope. Well, it's understandable. What you read, it. you sow. Yeah. 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 Well, Chris told us about the church up north that was burnt. That they also burnt down the uh, the cultural education center that was built with the specific um, purpose of teaching in their indigenous languages. Oh dear. Have really pay mm -hmm. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. there's, there's going to be some mess before this gets sorted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. About my my dad all day today because he was a an immigrant who loved this country, but he also um, spent a lot of time up north with the Cree and the Inuit and he felt a real kinship um, for them. And he also lived next door to um, the house that was next door to there was always occupied by an indigenous family because it was oh. housing. And he said he just loved listening to the, the kids running around speaking free. And, and so I, and he would hate the division. He, he was always the peacemaker and always mm -hmm. would just, he would hate to see this. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some time. One, one, one of the people in um, our parish, I, I just read on um, Facebook, um, they at, at 12 noon, their, their street, which isn't that big, uh, they all went out and um, had an, uh, read, somebody read an Indigenous prayer, and then they had a moment of silence. I thought that was kind of nice for a community, even one street, you know? Mm -hmm. That's one of those um, moments when you can flip that image I used at the end of uh, last week's session. So silence can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Holding silence, um, whereas before it just caused harm. On the other hand, I also saw a commercial today for, have you seen that commercial for Molson, <laughs> Molson's Canadian Beer? And it's, it's a big uh, refrigerator out in the middle of a street, and uh, it's, it's to... Uh, represent Canada's diversity. And um, before the refrigerator will open, yeah. somebody has to say, <laughs> has to say uh, I'm from Canada or something like that. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And, and about 10 languages. 
yeah and i've seen that yeah, yeah so it, or i'm canadian they have to say yeah. in about 10 or 11 different languages and they were just stuck with the last 10th person and then somebody comes up and says it in some language i don't know and then of course the refrigerator opened it was full of ice cold molson's beer <laughs> trust the beer company. i wouldn't i think there might have even been a uh, an aboriginal in that crew <laughs> Well, nice segue into Nicodemus. I <laughs> <laughs> mean, the Molsons? <laughs> opening door, opening doors. Door. Oh, okay. it, it is, but before we begin with Nicodemus, we certainly wanted to say thank you to our friends from Ottawa. Linda did take a poll last week to see if you wanted to meet this week or not, and you said yes. But I thought that we could at least start with. Oh, <laughs> oh Michael. Are we going to sing you. it in French? It switches in the middle from English to French back to English. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you, oh, Michael. Right. <clears throat> wow. That's great. Well, and that's very appropriate. Very appropriate. Well, um, so I'll go ahead and just kind of start. I won't, I won't go to the PowerPoint just yet. Um, rather, I'll just ask you a few questions. Um, just a, a few things, just to kind of refresh our recollections and uh, give you a chance to reflect on things. Uh, the first one is that in our in our series so far, this is the fifth of our series. Uh, we've looked at biblical characters who have experienced transformative encounters. Uh, I think you would agree with that. And seeing how artists and poets have interpreted those encounters, have there been any particular descriptions? Uh, of those encounters that we've explored that have been particularly revealing to you? Anything that really has struck you? Well, for me, it was the Eve, um, the way she is interpreted in, by modern artists in poetry or in art, like, well, poetry is art, but in um, painting. Yeah, I nice. thought that was I, I hadn't followed any of that. And it gave me a different picture of <laughs> the biblical sense of Eve. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other? That's among other things, but that was. Yeah. One. Yeah. That's great. One thing that stuck out to me was how prominent Hagar was in the various portraits or statuary. Um, because, you know, my recollection of her story in the Bible is she's very much the side issue. You know, she, she's not the main feature, but she certainly was the main feature in the various art pieces we saw. Any others? For me, it was the reading, the second reading of, uh, of Paul and I uh, don't have a, reten a retentive memory, but it was the one that where he thanked each person and it was the warmth that came across and that really, that really struck me and I thought, I wish we could read that in church. Romans 16. Was that Romans 16? Thanks. Yeah. yeah. That, that really, the, the warmth and the love in that hit me. Mm-hmm. 
Any other highlights? Well, I didn't know. Um, <clears throat> I'm showing my ignorance here that Paul had ghostwriters for many of his <laughs> his um, writings. That's right. That's why you have to watch when you're reading the lesson that you don't attribute something yeah. to somebody who didn't write it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe unsolicited ghostwriters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I felt a little more tender about Paul after going through that session. And do you remember in that last image um, of Paul in prison and he's surrounded by books and I thought afterwards, if he didn't write that many letters, that's not Paul's letters. What if the artist's message is, Paul will be crushed by Roman law? Oh, possible. That's Rem that was Those Rembrandt. Books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. As Jesus was. <laughs> yeah. I liked all the different uh, images and emotions of Mary at the time of the Annunciation. I think we we had uh, we imagined her with a whole variety of reactions, and uh, she's depicted, of course, as in a variety of ages and. Uh, levels of sophistication and all that sort of thing. That was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thanks. Any others? Well, let me ask you another question. And that is tonight we're gonna to be looking at the encounter between Nicodemus and Jesus, and then the aftermath of that. Um, so what do you think of when you think of Nicodemus? George has already uh, told us, uh, or told me anyway, uh, quite correctly, that uh, Nicodemus is only mentioned three times in the Bible. Um, he's mentioned only in one book. He's mentioned in the Gospel of John, nothing, nowhere else. Right. Um, and there's, there's a, a method to John's madness, I suspect, in the way he describes Nicodemus. Um, so anyway, I was just wondering what you what you think of when you think of him. He's a Wasn't Pharisee. It? Yep, Pharisee. And he was he was fearful. He didn't want to be found out to be a follower of Jesus's. Absolutely right. Even until almost the very end. That's that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although people were suspicious, <laughs> some of his buddies were a little doubtful of him. So, uh, ah, they're always suspicious. They Any have other to thoughts? watch yeah. watch out for those students of Gamaliel. Gamaliel, <laughs> actually, are you going to talk about that, Joe? Are you going to talk uh, about? I'll I'll let you take that one. So yeah, go ahead. Well, just that um, Gamaliel was also called um, to speak when Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin. So um both nicodemus and paul were students of gamaliel who was considered uh, ottawa just lost its chief rabbi um somebody who'd been a very major figure in the religious life of this of this community gamaliel was very well respected and very well known and he was often look to to make a definitive pronouncement on one thing or another. Um, <clears throat> so it's interesting to me that uh, Nicodemus was a student of Gamaliel, but Gamaliel and the Sanhedrin, when Jesus was accused of um, blasphemy, said, well, we'll have to wait and see. Either this is of God or it's not, and we will know. We will know. So there was a wisdom piece, and Nicodemus seemed to be somebody who had watched and decided that maybe this Jesus was of God. Mm -hmm. Or certainly was at least willing to say, well, wait a minute, this isn't the way we do things. Let's let's be patient here for a second. Or at least all the way. Yeah. yeah. But we'll do it and 
you know, when nobody's watching, we'll do it at night. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let me just share with you, um, you know, the, the Gospel of John, it's either probably going to be your favorite gospel or your, hmm, I'm not so sure about that one. I don't know which one it is for you. Um, but John is certainly organized in a way <clears throat> that uh, he wants to point to Jesus as, as the sign toward to God. Um, and so there are any number of signs or, that are recounted uh, in the Gospel of John. Um, the visit to Nicodemus comes very early mm. in the Gospel. It's in the third chapter after the prologue that we read on Christmas um, every year in the liturgy, uh, in the lectionary, and after Jesus calls a few disciples. <clears throat> and then we have the wedding at Cana to introduce Jesus um, into uh, his his ministry. Uh, and again, we talked about that a little bit last week uh, with Mary. And then we get right into Nicodemus. We get right into to this visit. Um, and so let me just share with you a little bit about the, uh, about the reading. And this is from the NRSV. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, or born again. Or born again. Right. So Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. And he goes on. Uh, and this is um, and, and this is the the passage where uh, very shortly Jesus you know says uh, the John three sixteen for God to love the world um, that we see in football and games and American TV and I don't know if it's on Canadian TV or not but you know we, we want to put John three sixteen out in your face <clears throat> and this is where this passage is from. The, pass the next passage uh, that we get to about Nicodemus is from the seventh chapter. So a few more signs have gone by. And the temple police were uh, being asked by the chief priest to arrest Jesus, who had gone and made trouble, uh, I guess if you want to put it that way, in the, uh, in the temple. And the, and, the, and the temple police said, never has anyone spoken like this. The Pharisee said, surely you've not been deceived too, have you? Has any one of the authorities or of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which does not know the law, they are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of them, asked, our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they were doing does it? They replied, surely you're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. So that's the second thing. And the last uh, description in, uh, or the, the last mention 
and the gospel is from the 19th chapter of John. And it's after these things, after Jesus has been crucified, <clears throat> Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial customs of the Jews. That's, that's what we, that's the biblical account of Nicodemus. Um, so let's, I'm gonna share the screen for just a second. Maybe. Okay. So we have the three account, the three accounts of uh, Nicodemus in the Bible. But um, let me share with you the first uh, piece of art, the piece, the first painting. And just as we saw a, an interesting uh, description by this same artist, Henry Osawa Tanner, uh, who is the African-American late 19th century uh, artist who depicted Mary uh, being spoken to by the angel and the angel was um, just pure light, basically. Uh, now uh, Tanner describes or paints Nicodemus visiting Jesus by night. Um, so I'll let you look at this one for just a second, see what you think. If anyone has any thoughts about this one. I like where, that, where the sorry. light is. Oh, no, go ahead, Joe. No, 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 no. Go, please go ahead. No, I just like where the light is. Yeah, Jesus. the light is from the from the house, I guess, uh, coming up the steps, and I guess, um, ref, well, or where is the light coming from? Is it coming from Jesus? I suppose it is. Mm -hmm. That that light from the house would have been the candlelight, I think, yeah. if this is a nighttime scene, but. Um, I think that the posture also of Nicodemus is fascinating. Mm -hmm. To me, it's um, exactly I would have envisioned from you reading the first encounter between the two of them, where he's, he went in the night to, to see what he was all about. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a, a, to me, a beautiful um, replication of, of that story. I think the steps with the light shining on them is quite significant too, because they, it's the idea of sort of marking that rising to Jesus, it pointing the way to him almost. It, it's, it's very like, if it were just light, it's very strong. Mm -hmm. And then the yeah. light over his heart. Mm -hmm. Right. And also just the way where his knee is, that it's almost like a, like almost like a direct arrow that connects the two, the light on the stairs and the light on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do you see? The mm -hmm. fold on his knee. I noticed uh, Nicodemus has his hands just resting on his knees and, uh, and then his, his posture as he's uh, seated. Um, it seems like he's really attentive. Do we know how old Nicodemus was? Um, all we know is that he was a leader of the Jews and a member of the Sanhedrin. So was, I would suspect he, that he's not uh, particularly, particularly young. young yeah, he looks kind of older there with kind of the kyphosis, kyphosis on the back. 
Mm -hmm. um, if you have a chance to read the little um, the little uh, comments on the bottom, um, you'll, see you'll see that there's, there's one other thing. It's hard to see because it's kind of obscured, I guess. But right over here where I've got my little arrow is an urn. Um, and you see the last one that may allude to his uh, to the death of Jesus and his burial because uh, Nicodemus is going to be bringing um, uh, spices for burial. So, based on what you've heard to this point um, and what you know uh, or think. What do you, why do you think Nicodemus went to see Jesus? Was he, was he there to accuse? Was he there to learn? Was he there for clarification? I mean, what, why was he there? He looks a little worried, concerned. I think he wanted, if he's an old man, maybe he was sort of looking toward the end of life and questioning a little bit of what he'd done and thought Jesus might have an answer. Yeah, yeah. Could be. Well, maybe he had he not heard about his teachings and wanted to go and I don't know why I'm echoing, but I think I am. Yeah, everybody um, is right now. Um, didn't he want to just find out about his teachings to I don't know whether it was for his own self or to take back to the Jewish people. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I've neglected to mention one thing, and, th and that is, I apologize for that, but in the, in the biblical account, in the Gospel of John, there are two things that happen in chapter two um, that Nicodemus may well have heard about. One of them is the wedding at Cana, uh, and the miraculous turning of water into wine. So that's one thing that happened. The other thing is, is that um, at, different from the order of things in the other gospels, Jesus doesn't wait until the very end of, uh, the, of Holy Week to clear out the temple, to clean the, you know, take the money changers and overturn the tables and so forth. In the gospel of John, he does that right after the wedding at Cana and right before Nicodemus. And so those are the two events, at least in the Gospel of John, that Nicodemus would have known about. Um, and so I guess he did want to see, who, who is this Who is this guy? Um, the other thing <clears throat> that I'm thinking about is that, you know, all of the people that we've chosen to kind of go into a little more depth on this encounter was life-changing. And so I think it's one thing to, to listen to hear say or, to, or listen to somebody else tell the story or preach it or um, paint it or write poetry about it. The ultimate end is the encounter the experience of Jesus, the experience of God, that <clears throat> gives us a sense that people's lives were changed. Mm -hmm. They went home another way. You know? Right. Right. Well, let's look at the, let's look at the next um, piece of art, and this is one that we kind of alluded to last week, um, because uh, Rembrandt uh, was a noted uh, painter of religious figures, uh, not really a religious artist, but certainly an artist who chose his subject for this, and um, this is um, Christ and Nicodemus, a pen and ink drawing, um, and how do you how do you like this depiction as opposed to the Tanner depiction? Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that Nicodemus is the figure uh, on the right, 
or on the, on the on the right of this picture. Jesus is this very interesting figure, or portrayed this very interesting way right here on the left. Um, any thoughts about that? To me, that's quite a different depiction. They seem much more relaxed, as if they're just, you know, sharing a conversation, not necessarily one of much import. Yeah. The style of the drawing, they look to me very like Commedia dell'arte figures. Um, you know, with totally a totally other mood. mood. A totally mm -hmm. different mood. Mm -hmm. So. I think I prefer the other one. <laughs> but this is Rembrandt. <laughs> well, but Jesus looks like he's bobbing and weaving. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, that's... yeah, it does. It does look that way. Looks yeah, like Jesus. he's blessing him <laughs> with his hand up. Yeah, Jesus looks, to me, it looks so much more engaged. Uh, than Nicodemus, who's um, almost leaning back a little ways, uh, it, it seems like to me. Um, I don't know. I, I like the other painting better, <laughs> but this is very interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. It looks like Jesus is trying to convince Nicodemus, and he's you know, thinking about it, but he's not bought into the idea. Right. Yes. Well, I think some of the poems that we're going to read are going to make that point very clear, at least in the in the minds of the poets that have written about them. Um, so here, I believe we, I think we've had uh, paintings by Tissot before. Um, but this one, uh, Tissot is late 19th century French. Um, and how do you like this one? The interview between Jesus and Nicodemus. And he's touching him in that one. Mm -hmm. It has more of a nighttime and a sort of hidden quality to it. There's more sort of stealth, with just the one small light. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of a confession. It looks like you think of a, a priest with a penitent, Jesus being the priest and Nicodemus the penitent. But in this one, Nicodemus is leaning forward uh, whereas in the Rembrandt one, it, it, my sense it was he was really a, a bit more remote, leaning back. And here they seem to be, he seems to be really leaning forward into uh, what Jesus is saying. Yeah, the attitude of the, of the two is a little different in each one. I mean, we go back to Tanner and they're yes. both... <clears throat> Um, quite upright. Jesus is very grave, it looks. And yes. then you get uh... It's more of an echo of the text about being born again to me in terms of intimacy. So mm -hmm. if Jesus is talking about um, an internal life or a physical birth or rebirth. Um, that's a very intimate and unusual subject. Um, and it seems that Tissot uh, has given us intimacy here. It's not, it's less about a scholar questioning some usurper of the law or testing, you know, how many commandments he knows or something like that. And it's not, it's not about what somebody else says. This is a, this is a very intimate moment that Tiso has captured. 
And in all three of them, Jesus' hands are doing something. They're not down at his side. I think all three of them, his hands are up or we can't say moving because it's a still, but it represents motion, you know, mm -hmm. all three of them. He's not just a passive recipient. Right. Mm -hmm. See over here, his hands up too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I liked it just so. I like this one too. Yeah. This one, this one captures to me kind of the way I feel about this because mm -hmm. if I were, you know, I think about this. I mean, the when the disciples, the disciples are routinely portrayed as people who were just kind of dopey guys who really didn't get Jesus. But I'm thinking, you know. This guy is completely unprecedented. I mean, and what if I had been there then back in the day, I would hope that I would be more like Nicodemus at least, because I'm trying to understand what this guy's talking about. And he answers my questions, which are perfectly logical, with some stuff about being born again and you know, all this stuff. And I'm thinking, oh my what? I don't understand this. That's just me. You know, so I'm, 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 I'm with you. I'm trying to lean forward and to try to make the best sense I can out of what this guy's talking about because I know he's important. I know that there's something here. I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, I have just the very vaguest, vaguest clue. Um. Well, there's more. This one. <laughs> This one I chose because it just looks more traditional to me, even though it's 1880. Um, I mean, it's fairly traditional. It's also, um, you know, a guy who uh, painted at the Trinity Church Copley Square in Boston. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe in, in uh, you know, places in New York. And he's an uh, instructor at the Met Museum in New York City. Um, you know, and so this one, this one leaves me a little bit colder, honestly, but there goes my theory of Jesus' hands in motion. Because <laughs> <laughs> here he isn't, he's sitting <clears throat> passively listening to him. Like... There's certainly a power shift with Jesus raised higher. Yeah, yes. My son and his family go to Trinity Church, Boston. And this one, the light is illuminating Nicodemus more so than Jesus. Yeah. And does that make does that make sense theologically? It seems like I mean, if Jesus is the light of the world, um, I don't know. Well, it's really lighting the scripture, isn't it? Is is that a Torah? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah, probably. Yeah, almost certainly, yeah. But it it illuminates uh, the value of question. Ah, yes, I like that. Which I really... Yes. Or maybe he's receiving the light. Michael, you keep muting me mid-sentence. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's been some feedback when Joe was talking, and so I, it just everybody would mute themselves when they're not actually talking. I think it might cut down on that feedback. Okay. Okay. That's all I'm doing. I have been playing whack a mole. Yes. You are playing whack a mole. I know you are. It's down with the questioners. Well, from Elizabeth's point, uh, it does illuminate the hands of Jesus, even though they're not moving. So it does make them a prominent feature of Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. In the last painting, though, I found it much more intimate in the connection, the body language. Jesus yeah. was touching Nicodemus at the same time as blessing. It kind of reminds me of Reiki practitioners. Mm. Mm. Right. 
I find this painting one of the most interesting as far as the light and the shadow is concerned. Mm -hmm. One, they both have shadows, which is a little bit unusual, but the, the where where the light seems to be shining, it's in different places in the picture. And they were very tidy and they took their shoes off, mm -hmm. left them on the corn and the curb there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, going back to the other one, the, the last one, in any um, in any conversation between two people, one is going to be <clears throat> talking while the other one's listening. So maybe it's significant that Jesus is listening to him. Maybe explain why he's there or what's all this about being born again and just chose to put the focus on him and Jesus listening quietly. Mm -hmm. Well, and that would certainly be consistent with the with the biblical account. I mean, Jesus didn't, you know, just blurt out, "Oh, you must be born again." I mean, he he responded to a question. Um, mm -hmm. Looks like Jesus is sizing him up too. Like he's really taking in what he's saying, and then perhaps trying to phrase his response. There's a real calmness and steadiness about about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a very loving glance that Jesus has. There's a loving, for me, a loving gaze toward Nicodemus. There's a kind of a unconditional regard for who is in front of him. Um, yeah. That's where I see the tenderness in Lafarge's piece. This mm -hmm. regard that he has for, mm -hmm. for this elder who has come because his heart has drawn him there. I don't see judgment, I see hospitality. I'm, be, I'm, I'm liking this, this painting more, so. <laughs> let's let's um, change gears for just a second. And there are a few poems that I have um, that I'd like to share with you. This first one comes from Henry Vaughan, uh, 17th century. Uh, the background of Henry, and this, this may be of some interest, um, I mean, the, the title is The Night, uh, and the subtitle is John 3, 2, which is G Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Um, and so it's definitely about Nicodemus, but when you read this, well, it's about more than that. So um, I wonder if anybody would... Uh, be willing it's a little bit long but it's uh, i think it's worth it is, is anybody willing to read this one sure i could right thank you through that pure virgin shrine that sacred veil drawn o'er thy glorious noon that men might look and live as glowworms shine and face the moon wise nicodemus saw such light as made him known his God, as made him know his God by night. Most blessed believer he, who in that land of darkness and blind eyes, thy long expected healing wings could see when thou didst rise. And what can never more be done, did at midnight speak with the sun. Oh, who will tell me where he found thee at that dead and silent hour? What hallowed solitary ground did bear so rare a flower within whose sacred leaves did lie the fullness of the deity? No mercy seat of gold, no dead and dusty cherub, nor carved stone, but his own living works did my Lord hold and lodge alone, where trees and herbs did watch and peep and wonder, 
while the Jews did sleep. Dear night, this world's defeat, the stop to busy fools, cares check and curb, the day of spirits, my soul's calm retreat which none disturb, Christ's progress and his prayer time, the hours to which high heaven doth chime. God's silent searching flight, when my Lord's head is filled with dew and all his locks are wet with the clear drops of night, his still soft call, his knocking time, the soul's dumb watch when spirits their fair kindred catch, were all my loud evil days calm and unhaunted as is thy dark tent, whose peace but by some angel's wing or voice is seldom rent, then I in heaven all the long year would keep and never wander here. But living where the sun doth all things wake and where all mix and tire themselves and others, I consent and run to every mire and by this world's ill-guiding light, err more than I can do by night. There is in God, some say, a deep but dazzling darkness, as men here say it is late and dusky, because they see not all clear. Oh, for that night, where I in him might live invisible and dim. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that bit. There is in God, some say, a deep but dazzling darkness. I don't think we do enough preaching and speaking about darkness. Darkness always seems to be an evil thing, but there is a, there is a holiness about darkness too. Yes. And I'm trying to figure out what kind of poetry that is. <laughs> is that narrative? Is that epic? It's well, they're called the metaphysical poets. So oh, okay. Is, is that a type of poetry, metaphysical? Yeah, they're 17th century, Vaughan, Treherne, okay. other people like that. And they write on religious themes, but in a very, um, lots of metaphor and image. Yeah, because some, some of it's rhyme and some of it isn't. And... Yeah. Well, just from a pure poetic, uh, just a couple, th a couple of things, this uh, poet, was actually not very well known uh, in the 17th century. He was, a, he was a royal, you remember this is the time of the English uh, Civil War, um, the Commonwealth and all of that. Um, he was a committed royalist um, and, um, and he saw the Church of England basically be dismantled by Cromwell and so forth for a, for a space of time. Uh, Archbishop Laud was uh, executed, um, you know, during his lifetime when he was a fairly young man. The king was also uh, beheaded um, within a few years after Laud was executed. Um, and then uh, Cromwell kind of, um, well, the, the times changed and uh, the kings came back and the church came back and, and so all of that. This was done a little bit after um, the restoration, uh, if you will. Uh, but he had lived through the night, if you will, um, the, cri the time of crisis. And so he, along with John Donne and George Herbert and uh, the other poets that uh, Patricia mentioned, uh, was one of the metaphysical poets that, um, that she's done a much better job of explaining who, what they were like than, than I could have. So thank you for that. Um, so Nicodemus is only mentioned once in this poem, but um, he comes off pretty well, um, I think. Uh, how does this strike you? How does Vaughan's uh, description uh, and interpretation of Nicodemus uh, and the night come across? I think there's lots of things in this poem that match the artwork. Like the darkness and, you know, the light, silent. Mm -hmm. 
I think he speaks about the night as being an act of time for Jesus in that it is his prayer time. And after all the busyness of the day, um, that this is a time. And so the knock from Nicodemus comes at this time. Uh, Jesus is, you know, his locks are wet with the dew and so on, but he has been up all in the night praying and so on. And so um, Nicodemus finds him there ready to talk. Mm -hmm. Well, the only reference, the, um, the only, and as far as Nicodemus is concerned, the, you know, the reference is wise Nicodemus. Um, that's it. That's the, that's the descriptor for him. Um, So as I say, even though Nicodemus was having a hard time following Jesus talking about being born again and all that stuff, um, he was he was certainly wise to recognize that there was something that there was something he needed to look into, um, e even at a fairly early point in Jesus' ministry, as far as the Gospel of John is concerned. Um, how many do uh, I don't know if um, Patricia, you talked about the about the, you know, it would be a helpful thing if we talked more about the dark, uh, about the night. Um, mm -hmm. And a, a book that I really love is by Barbara Brown Taylor. And I, I, I see Linda shaking her, yes. Um, I don't know if, she, if she's well known in Canada. Yes. Uh, if, uh, if not, um, then I would encourage you to, to look her up. There's a, a book that she wrote about um, living in the, or, you know, about living in the dark. That's not the right title but um uh but it talks about that topic very much and she's just a wonderful writer preacher uh and um and she talks a lot about about that um and i love the the meta the uh there is an as you, as patricia's already said there is in god some say a deep but dazzling darkness mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about this poem? Joe, you had said that Nicodemus it may not understand the idea of being born again, but that he's engaging it and willing to discuss it. And Patricia, I think it goes back to your observations about darkness and we should discuss it more, but it's in the seventh stanza here, where all my loud evil days calm and unhaunted as is thy dark tent, and then a couple of stanzas down, the deep but dazzling darkness. The darkness is not portrayed here as something that is um, scary, frightening. Oh, it's it's okay. presented as something calm. Um, and I think that that helps explain why Nicodemus can engage in things that are not that well known to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think it is curious that the church in particular really wants us to think that things done in, in the light um, are, have more value than things done in the dark. And certainly um, the monastic hours, the monks and nuns and keep the daily office uh, through the night, through the night watches. There's nothing... Um, there's, not a judgment about who seeks God where and when. But we, we have equated looking for God in the dark as being in the dark ourselves. So <clears throat> I think we could do a, a better job unpacking that. It's also where most people or many people, I don't want to say most people, but when there's distress in, <clears throat> in your life, um, what it disturbs normally is sleep. And that's a time when, we, when we're looking for answers or comfort, if not an answer. So... Mm -hmm. I was struck by this, um, to speaking of the dark, it's my soul's uh, calm retreat, which none disturb. And in Christ's progress in his prayer time, the hours in which high heaven doth chime. 
yeah, the chiming uh, is um, uh, that that you know struck me too as um, um, progress, prayer time, chime, maybe uh, a time to enlighten or be enlightened. Mm -hmm. The question at the bottom asks if um, we've ever received revelation that you don't think you would have received during the day. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you when I think of myself, often you're in bed with the light out and all these great ideas come to you. They may not all be divine, but uh, they're wonderful ideas and uh, things that you hadn't thought about when your mind's busier and, and you're busy during the day. Either there or in the showers when I have my <laughs> revelations. <laughs> showers are good. That's right. Yeah. But there's some people that keep notebooks by their bedside at night because they get yeah. these wonderful ideas mm -hmm. and they don't want to lose them because by the morning they may be gone. Mm -hmm. So I, I get when I saw that dazzling darkness, I think of death and in a very positive way because when we die there's that there's that ending of of life and the idea of darkness but it's it's like being bursting into something else so darkness brings brightness somehow one follows the other um, yeah. oh, thanks that's good Any, any other thoughts about this? Uh, I think the, the third and fourth stanzas also kind of stood out to me, uh, kind of a little bit contra to the, um, well, actually, you know, the Bible passage doesn't say that Jesus or that Nicodemus went because he was fearful. It says he went to Jesus by night, period. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't characterize that one way or the other. And the third and fourth stanzas say, well, Nicodemus probably figured, well, where, where am I going to find him? I'll find him at night. And I don't need to find him in some fancy, fancy place with, you know, mercy seats of gold and cherubs and carved stones and so forth. But I'll just be out there. He's going to be out in nature. That's, that's where he's going to be. Um, I like that. So. But what would have happened if his, if his, um, you know, his the other members, Pharisee members, um, I don't know the name of the thing you talked about, but saw him? Is he doing it partly because he doesn't want to be seen, or is he doing it because he knows he might find Jesus at night, maybe by himself? We don't know. We don't know. And I'm sure that there was a, a mixture of both of those. And, and I don't want to discount the fact that he, he did not uh, own up to being a follower of Jesus um, immediately. Um, but I do think what happened is that he, he fairly early on went to, went to inquire of Jesus what he could. And I'm sure that all of these comments that Jesus made to him about being born again and so forth were things that he thought about uh, and reflected on. Uh, because otherwise, why would he have been there when Jesus died? Um, that's just my take on it. I mean, it's the, the arc of the way John describes his progress or his, his life. Uh, in, you know, his encounter with Jesus makes perfectly good sense. You know, so many of the Bible stories, you know, we hear G somebody comes to see Jesus, you know, or they have an encounter with Jesus, and then we don't know what happened to them. And we kind of all assume, oh, well, they, they were great, and it was peachy, and everything was wonderful ever after. Or, you know, like the rich young ruler, you know, they surely, you know, made the wrong decision, and that was it. That's all there was to it. He never changed his mind or anything. I don't think that's the way people are. Um, 
and you know, I think a lot of reflection goes on, a lot of change goes on, both good and bad. Um, and so for me, John's description of Nicodemus over the course of the few years that we're talking about makes perfectly good sense to me. And it's very helpful. That's just me. What do I know? Here's another one. Um, oh. This one, this poem is, you know, I have gotten, I don't have the correct name. It, it is Mary Elizabeth, but it's Mary Elizabeth, somebody else. Um, and I, I, I'll, I apologize for not having her, her full name here. Um, and I don't even, I, I have, um, well, anyway, May I, may I impose on someone to read this poem for us? I'll, I'll read, Joe. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Nicodemus by Mary Elizabeth. With slow and stealthy steps he trod the darkening and deserted streets, and no one in the market greets the man upon his way to God. By night he left the splendid home that sheltered many a sleeping guest. One and another lay at rest. The master of the house would roam. Was there a single soul that knew? No, for he feared the eye of scorn, the crooked laugh of anger born. Only the bats about him flew. The broidered borders of his gown he covered o'er that none might see. Shall good come out of Galilee? This were the mock of all the town, but in the city named for peace, no peace his weary heart had known, and ever in the crowd alone he waged a war that would not cease. He came by night, and yet he came, and he that was himself the way shall own him, in the judgment day and to the world confess his name. Oh. Thank you. By the way, this is Mary Elizabeth Coleridge, uh, who was related to Samuel Taylor Coleridge um, and was from a very literary family. Um, so uh, she wrote several volumes of poetry and so forth. Anyway, it's for what that's worth. What do you think about this one? What strikes you? Well, in this one, it seems to be a lot more evident that he was trying to avoid um, people seeing him. Whereas in the previous poem, it seemed more that he was avoiding the light because in the darkness, that's where you see the light and that's where he would see the light of God or Jesus or the truth. Whereas in this one, it's more that he's trying to avoid being mocked or being questioned for, for going to see this man that not everybody believed. Mm -hmm. This poem also implies that there was more than just asking a question. Mm -hmm. No peace his weary heart had known, and ever in the crowd alone. He waged a war that would not cease. That's quite a different imagining, uh, creative imagining of <clears throat> kind of the emotional state or spiritual state of Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it strike you as being plausible or true? And you think back to Paul. Uh, I mean, I don't think Paul had no intention of encountering Jesus um, until Jesus knocked him off the horse. Um, he didn't think, you don't get the sense that Paul was ever anything other than victorious and triumphant in his uh, war against the, against Jesus and the, and the, and the 
followers of Jesus until until he got whacked. Um, but you get the sense here that uh, Nicodemus is that he's been struggling for a while. That something something's not work, something's not right as far as he's concerned. And maybe Jesus has got the right answer. I think the second last stanza shows that he's got some questioning or trouble within him. Like, no peace is weary heart had known and ever in the crowd alone. He waged a war that would not cease. But the last stanza, he came by night and, and yet he came. That's Nicodemus. And then the last two refer to Jesus. He, he doesn't know at this point that Jesus is going to, that Jesus is the way and show him the you know, own him on the judgment day. That's my read on it. Mm -hmm. Any others? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it, I'm wondering a little bit more about the spiritual community of the poet. Um, there's such an assumption um, kind of a reading in to how people might come to God. Um, and even though it's imagined, I, I just wonder whether it's only trouble that brings people to God. So it, it sounds to me a little... Um, conversion oriented or uh, saving your soul. I, I don't know. It just made me wonder about the spirituality of the poet. Mm -hmm. Are you referring to the phrase, there's no atheists in the ox holes? Well, this poem, she is American. Yeah. And that says something. <laughs> um, and the time period that she's writing in is the late 19th, early 20th century. So, uh, you know, that could easily lead to, um, you know, the, the correctness of Linda's, uh, you know, surmise about, um, about her state of mind, her state of community, and you know, all of that kind of thing. Um, But that's where she was, you know. So, any other thoughts about this one? This idea of him coming from a place of wealth and kind of going to the other side of town to find God, like he's covering up his embroidered gown and he's coming from this splendid home to a place that sounds like it's not so splendid and a little more, um, as my son would say, sketchy. <laughs> he thinks everything's sketchy if he doesn't know what it's all about. So, well, that's that's where he's coming from. So, <laughs> and after all, he's just been admitted to two universities. So, I mean, you know, there's <laughs> something there. The scripture doesn't uh, give any indication that Nicodemus is troubled or worry, weary hearted and waging a war that won't cease. It just, it, doesn't it just indicate he wants to find out what this person is all about that makes, does miracles? Or am I wrong? Well, the, I don't right. think you... I, I, I don't think you can, I think the scripture just says what it says. <laughs> we don't get into interior states too yeah, much. Yeah, like this, yeah. like this poem. And so, <laughs> and so I don't know whether the poem is helpful um, or not. Maybe not. It certainly is helpful to the poet, um, you know, to, to look at things this way. You know, the other thing that's going on at the time that she's writing 
uh, as America is in the midst of the, the Gilded Age, uh, you know, in our history, where the, you know, industry, the tycoons of industry, you know, whom she would have been, you know, had some familiarity with, are very rich. I mean, you know, income inequality is growing and very bad in America at, during this time. Um, and so she may be reflecting on, um, you know, the cultural, you know, setting as well, um, you know, to assume, you know, that this uh, Nicodemus, who was undeniably, you know, part of the power establishment, you know, of his time, the Sanhedrin was, you know, kind of in control, sort of, I mean, yeah, you know, the Romans were really in control, but I mean, still, you know, um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's all of that that's going on as well. Well, let's look at the, let's look at one or two more things. Um, the next one is, um, a woodcut, Christ and Nicodemus, um, part of a series of woodcuts depicting the life or depicting scenes from the life of Christ. Um, you know, a little bit different sense here of uh, Jesus and Nicodemus, certainly as opposed to the Tissot and uh, the Lafarge and all of the other paintings that we looked at at the beginning. Um, any thoughts about this one? Well, to me, it, Christ looks so angry, he's terrified. Mm. I think it's interesting that it's done in 1919, so just after the devastation of the First World War. Right. Uh, it, it gives it a, that kind of dark quality, I think. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus really seems to be, he's a smaller figure, his arms are raised up almost, whether it's questioning or pleading. Um, he, he, he looks like someone really trying to find the answer. He seems more, I would say, a bit more desperate than we've seen him before. Mm. Thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> and his head is turned to the side rather than looking at the Christ figure, Nicodemus' head is, is like turned away. Is he afraid to actually look at Christ? I don't, I don't know. Well, the limitations of a woodcut would mean that if he were facing Christ face to face, the way this depiction is done, we wouldn't be able to see any expression yeah. at right. all. <clears throat> and of course, this black and white um, piece and the you know, I immediately kind of pull back from, well, the one who's in need is black and Jesus is all white and, but it, it's really the art form. The woodcut was, would lend yourself, would lend itself to um, this kind of a stark contrast. And it also makes me think um, it's very interesting that the Nicodemus figure, where the light is in that figure. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just interesting that the limitations of the art form and all of our uh, consciousness, mm -hmm. current consciousness, um, bias us, I think, in our reading. I was thinking um, of Nicodemus being in a uh, receiving information and pondering. And, you know, you've got a, a white hand and a black hand. And I was thinking in terms of, you know, when you're piecing something out in your mind, you've got on the one hand this, on the other hand that, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you really, you haven't really come to the exact conclusion yet, but you're still in a 
um, contemplating state. Yeah. Well, hold this image in your mind because the next one is a little different. <laughs> This, uh, this artist, um, if you read the little piece, is um, worked in an advertising agency in, uh, in the 60s. This painting was probably in the 70s. Um, uh, but it reminds me of Mad, uh, of Mad Men or something like that. Um, I'm surprised they're not smoking and you know having a, <laughs> well, anyway. Um, what do you what do you think of this this um, inquisit this little qu inquisition? Does Nicodemus tell, sound more <laughs> sound more real to you on this one? You can tell he's American. He has short pants. <laughs> <laughs> just had to say it. <laughs> oh my! Well, I'm not going to show you what I'm wearing then. <laughs> Yeah, he looks like he looks like Mike Wallace, <laughs> you know, yeah. in an <laughs> interrogation interview. Looks like he's <laughs> trying to sell him something, yeah, rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. I don't think Jesus um, was up to speed on the latest fashion. <laughs> certainly got mid-century furniture and color scheme that's for sure that's for sure there's, no, sh yeah. there's no shag rug though patricia <laughs> well hard to tell <laughs> well really a, a, a big a big detail they should have had shag rugs you're right well I think Je jesus has got birkenstocks <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, one more, one more, um, one more, well, one more painting. I'm gonna, yes, here we go. This Ooh, one is wow. very current. Um, Lauren Wright Pittman, uh, only within the last 10 years or so, graduated with an art degree from Middle Tennessee State University. She went on to become a Presbyterian minister. And one of the things that she likes to do, and I don't know, quite know how this would work, but she, um, you know, basically does paintings um, live during worship services while the preacher is preaching. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't think this one was done that way, but that's one of the things that she does. Um, but this piece, well, you can read a little bit about it, but this one is uh, Nicodemus's mind being blown um, by the things coming out of Jesus's mouth. And as she said, well, you know, if, if Nicodemus had just looked at Jesus, you know, he probably would have gotten a much better sense of what Jesus was talking about and, um, you know, had a much better reaction to, to Jesus. But this is, as she, as she goes on and he says, Jesus is right in front of his face. He can reach out and touch him, but they're light years away from one another. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I do get a sense of that. I mean, I I, I do. I wonder how I would like. I say I, I've already told you that I'm not so sure that I would have immediately picked up on this born again stuff from Jesus if that's the first time I'd heard about it. And I'm trying to follow what Jesus is talking about. Reactions? Any? Well, it's not, it may be true at that moment, but he obviously uh, received some of the information from Jesus, according to the scripture. Oh, yeah. He went back a couple of times, didn't he? Mm hmm So maybe he went for clarification, though, because he didn't understand it the first time. It's the first time we've seen the wind um, show. Yeah. And the wind is forming a cue for question. <laughs> it's, it's so refreshing to see images with people of color. I'm, I get so tired of the 
um, white Jesus. So a number, a mitiso, I, I, or maybe it was uh, Tanner. I guess it was Tanner that you could tell that the <clears throat> complexion was darker. And I, yes. I really love, I mean, the universality of John's gospel in particular makes me feel as if this is such a good choice for, for that text. I really uh, love it. I love the images and the sort of motion in the thing. I, I can never stand to go to biblical movies. I just, I can't do it. Uh, I, I do much better if I can see a depiction that is imaginative and um, brings out metaphors and images and things like that. You know, I don't want to see Moses played by Charlton Heston <laughs> or Jesus played by whoever. Not Jesus Christ Superstar then. You don't want to go to Broadway and no, I didn't. I mean, I can sing many of the songs, but I don't care that much for it. What, what a year was this, Joe? Did this you would tell have been, yeah, this was within the last five to 10 years. Oh, okay. so it's, it's very recent. It's great. Yeah, I love this uh, painting and the motion in it. Um, and yeah, the uh, um, they look like they're from the Middle East. I like it. Yeah. Very good. Very good. I think it's interesting because um, Nicodemus has the knowledge of law and doctrine, but Jesus talks in metaphors. So it kind of makes sense that it would be really difficult for him to grasp this stuff. It's kind of like, you know, an English lit major talking to a mathematician, like that's what happens in our family because I'm the English lit major and my husband is the mathematician. And, you know, I can't really talk metaphor to him because he likes everything to be set out in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of see that because throughout his life, when he was talking to people, he was always talking in metaphor. And if Nicodemus is this very kind of law uh, or learning the law and and, uh, and the rules, I can see that this would be a very difficult thing for him to understand and to really grasp. Gotcha, gotcha. Sort of following up on that, Jesus is speaking and he's weeping. The, this is the, tear, the teardrop shapes under the eyes and, and the mouth. He's, he's speaking in a way that's hard to understand, that's different from what Nicodemus is accustomed to. Mm -hmm. And the wind whirls where it will. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Well, just a couple more things. If you'll bear with me for just, just a little bit. This one um, is from a universal, universal, uni, Unitarian Universalist, or I've got the UUs back up, back mixed up probably, but uh, this pastor, would anybody care to read this poem? I mean, we've talked about being born again and uh, most poems that talk about being born again, I wouldn't even bother with. It's kind of like Patricia just said, it's, uh, well, I won't go there, but, um, but this one just struck me as a little bit different. I'll I read try. it. Oh, go ahead, whoever oh, you want. Oh, Julie. Oh, okay. okay. Born <laughs> again. Let's be clear about this. It isn't the same as being sick and getting better. It isn't changing your mind at the last minute or pushing away from the brink. The only way to be born again is to die. The phoenix doesn't just go up in a blaze of glory. It feels the fire lick up and sizzle every feather until each quill becomes a column of flame carried straight to the core. Whatever the legend of rebirth, there is always time in the fire, under the ground, 
hanging on the cross or the tree. Don't skip over that part of the story. If you would be reborn, you have to die. But what then? After the dying, how are we to rise again into new life? The earth, the hero, the God, you and I? How does any of us find our way back from the valley of the shadow? The same way we die, walk into the light. I'm just going to leave that one with you. Um, just one last uh, piece of art. Oh. This is from Michelangelo. Um, this is in Florence, of course. Uh, this is a Pieta. Um, he was not commissioned to do this uh, paint or this uh, sculpture. Um, rather, he did it for his own, for, his, for himself. Um, and he, the, the, the rumors are Vasari, George, uh, Vasari talks about how he got so unhappy with the way one part of it worked that he almost started to destroy it and then put it out to be re repaired. But the reason for, or the main reason that this um, sculpture is in this presentation, at least as far as I'm concerned, is because um, the figure of Jesus is being taken down from the cross by Mary, his mother, and Mary Magdalene, and Nicodemus. Um, and that is, um, you know, there is scriptural, you know, authority for that. Um, Nicodemus has his arms uh, around both of the Marys to support them. Um, and this is obviously a very loving, uh, strong figure that is taking care of this. Um, it's said that Michelangelo, uh, and this is from the 1550s, so remember your, uh, your history. Uh, this is fairly early on still in the Reformation. Uh, Michelangelo was in Italy, um, which was certainly a Catholic country, was getting some of his work, a, a lot of his work from the church and from the Pope. But it is said that he uh, was kind of a closet Protestant, if you will. Uh, he believed in Martin Luther's, uh, you know, uh, theology that we're saved by grace through uh, faith. Um, but he, like Nicodemus, um, had to keep it quiet because that would have basically, you know, got him out of all the commissions that the Catholic Church was giving to him at the time, uh, because that was one of the big points of contention. Um, and so uh, it is said that John Calvin, who was around this time a little bit, just fairly soon after this, um, you know, came up with the term Nicodemist to describe someone who um, is suspected of publicly misrepresenting their religious faith because they didn't want to uh, lose respect in the eyes of the world, um, if you will. And so Michelangelo was aware of that uh, and considered himself to be a Nicodemus, if you will. And so the likeness of Nicodemus in this piece is that of Michelangelo. Um, and so I give you this one as the last, uh, the last artwork uh, for tonight. Eh, there's really one more, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it right here. I think because it's about eight thirty. Um, and if you're interested, uh, I think the PowerPoint slides and everything are on the website, so that you can look at those if you really want to. Um, just I'll just just quickly uh, mention one other thing. This is um, from the ninth century. The uh, the um, Orthodox Church basically has a a Sunday that they celebrate as the the Sunday of the myrrh bearing women, who are all of the women who came uh, to anoint Jesus um, 
after his burial. Um, and included in the myrrh-bearing women are Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Um, and so they are traditionally included in that time or in that because of the last scriptural or biblical reference uh, to Nicodemus being among those who took Jesus down from the cross and was a follower of Jesus at the end, at the end of his life. Um, the end of and I'm not going to talk about those. Um, at the end, I would just pose a last question, which is how would you depict or describe an encounter you've had with Jesus or a serpent or God or angels or Paul, any of those? And has any encounter converted or transformed you? So who knows? Maybe next week, Linda will lead off with that question and see if you have any comments about that. Um, but any, are there any other last comments or questions or thoughts for this evening? Because uh, it's, it's 8.30 or 8.31, so I don't want to keep you. Thank you for the great variety of images and so on. It was really, uh, I wouldn't have thought there'd be so much about Nicodemus, but it's been a very rich discussion. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. I'm just Thanks, wondering, did George have a question? I thought I saw his hand go up. Maybe I'm wrong. Is George still there? George? Uh, George, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, we can't hear him. No, oh, I want to hear what George is saying, but he's muted, so. George, you're muted. Can I there. Hear no, that's good. I always felt quite confident till Jesus came along that we the Pharisees were right and all the rest were wrong. But Jesus, though a rabbi, has a disconcerting gift for storing the familiar with an unfamiliar drift. At first I was quite certain as I heard what Jesus said, unraveling the Torah, that he turned it around. And every time some Oops, he's muted again. Yeah. I'll uh, send it to uh, Linda and she can publish it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very good. It's thank a little, you. A little light hearted. <laughs> thank All you, right. Joe, for such a thank you. Yeah. Fabulous collect, you know, what an array of different artwork <laughs> and poetry. It was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you all for your kind attention. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Happy Canada Day, everyone. Happy, Happy Canada yeah. Day. I hear the fireworks. There's yeah. some out here. Um, yeah, Linda? Now, next week's subject is Lot's wife who has. Um, oh, yes. One line of scripture. The pillar of salt. One line of scripture. Oh, I know. In the narrative. And yet, art and bad poetry and some good poetry <laughs> abounds. But um, anyway, happy Fourth of July and, to the Americans. Yes, happy Fourth of July. And Patricia, I saw Sodom and Gomorrah. So. It's about Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. Oh, you've been there. Uh, I saw the movie Sodom and Gomorrah a long oh, time ago. Okay. Yeah, well, you okay. can tell us about it. Yeah, you can. I'm not gonna. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have Bye. a good week. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. Joe.